Many young people have made the move to Los Angeles with dreams of making a name for themselves in film, despite the chances of those plans being realized being very low. Those who succeed usually go on to enjoy a prosperous and fulfilling career, but those who fail are either forced to return to their hometowns or keep trying in hopes that one day they'll get their big break. 21-year-old Juliana Redding was one such aspiring actress who moved from Arizona to Santa Monica in 2005. But her story would have a tragic ending with many twists and turns along the way. It's a case that's resulted in many people questioning whether justice was served, since the outcome was not what anyone expected. And today, Juliana's family must live with the knowledge that the criminal who took her life may never face the consequences of their heinous actions. Juliana grew up in Tucson, Arizona, where she attended South Point Catholic High School. And by all accounts, she had a great childhood. She was close with her family, and after graduating, she decided to move to California as she had aspirations of becoming a model. But her real ambition was to own her own business one day, and she told her parents, Patricia and Greg, that she would like to open a boutique in the future. After arriving in Los Angeles, she kept in touch with her family on a regular basis. She would often call her parents and catch up and let them know how her plans were going. They would also text each other often, and on occasion, she would make the trip back to Tucson for a visit. By 2008, she was living alone in a bungalow in Santa Monica while she was studying at Santa Monica College. To make extra money, she worked as a hostess in a restaurant while looking for opportunities in modeling or acting. For the time being, Juliana seemed content with her situation. But all of that would change on the 16th of March of that year, when Patricia found out that she couldn't make contact with her daughter. What's known is that Juliana played a round of golf on the 15th of March, after which she returned to her bungalow and opted to spend the night in, watching TV, specifically Seinfeld reruns. The following evening, Patricia became increasingly concerned when she received a call from Juliana's neighbors, who informed her that they hadn't seen her at all that day and her dog was seen inside her bungalow, but the place seemed completely deserted. Patricia repeatedly dialed her number in hopes that she would answer, but she never did, and also never returned any of her mother's calls. At first, she thought she may just be busy, but when she hadn't received a reply by 6 p.m., she knew something wasn't right. It was then that she decided it was time to call the police. Patricia explained the situation to investigators and asked whether they could do a welfare check, to which they agreed. Officers traveled to the bungalow and looked around outside, but saw nothing out of place or suspicious. Her car was still parked in the driveway, which suggested that she should be home, but the bungalow was silent. But when they entered the building, they knew something strange had happened. They noticed a candle burning in the bungalow's main entrance, and then immediately detected the odor of natural gas, which they then discovered was coming from the gas stove that had been left on, but the burner wasn't lit, meaning the entire room was now essentially a time bomb. Then they made an even more unsettling discovery. After searching through the house, they walked into the back bedroom, and here they found Juliana. Unfortunately, she was no longer alive. It didn't take detectives long at all to realize that she had been strangled, but it was also obvious that she put up quite a fight against her attacker. From all indications, it seemed that a violent struggle had taken place throughout the apartment. This theory was confirmed when it was revealed that Juliana's DNA was present under her own fingernails, suggesting that she was attempting to remove her attacker's hands from her throat. There were very few clues as to who had ended her life, but one thing that was certain was whoever entered the apartment had plans to cover their tracks by blowing up the apartment. They'd hoped that the gas emanating from the stove would react with the lit candle, thereby creating an explosion that would have wiped out a lot of evidence at the scene. It's believed that thanks to the age of the building, the gas never had a chance to build up enough to cause an explosion. And before long, investigators started to piece together what they believed happened in the moments leading up to Juliana's death. They believed someone entered the bungalow at around 10 p.m. on the night of the 15th of March. After gaining entry, they attacked Juliana and at some point had caused injuries to her head by hitting her against the floor. 
Since this was a prolonged attack, investigators believed that her assailant didn't expect her to put up such a fight, and in the end, they had to resort to strangulation. It would later be determined that Juliana attempted to contact emergency services at some point, as her phone records showed that she dialed 911, but the call ended before it could connect. The neighbors who had contacted Patricia told officers that they heard the sounds of furniture being moved around and someone screaming at about 9.53 the previous night, but added that they hadn't seen anyone suspicious in or around the building. And it's certainly a shame they didn't take the situation more seriously, but you can't really blame them too much. Like they said, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and it could have been a small party or something for all they knew. Evidence was collected from the scene of the crime, including several DNA samples that were found on the building's front door, the phone, Juliana's clothing, and on her throat. These samples were sent into a lab for analysis, but they would take some time to reveal who'd been inside her apartment. In the meantime, investigators interviewed Juliana's family and friends, who gave them as many details about her life as they could. When speaking to crime scene experts, Juliana's father suggested that they contact a man named John Gilmore, with whom Juliana had been in an on-again, off-again relationship. He added that he was concerned about Juliana when he found out they were dating, since Gilmore was known to have had a violent temper, which became all the more apparent when he kicked in her car door on one occasion and had also forced his way into her apartment. When investigators heard this news, they felt like they finally found the lead they'd been hoping for. They immediately set out to locate John, and it didn't take long at all before they found their man. When John Gilmore was interviewed, he stated that he'd been to Juliana's place that Sunday morning, but got no answer at the door, despite her car being parked in the driveway. He looked in through the security gate, but could only see the burning candle, though he'd never smelled any gas. When asked about the violent incidents that they'd been told about, he admitted that he and Juliana had on occasion gotten into fights, one of which took place that Saturday night when they started arguing about his plans for the evening. He would called her to tell her that he was planning on spending some time with some of his friends that night, and this must have irked her, since she abruptly ended the call. He claimed that she then decided to spend the evening with one of her own friends, and he ended up going to a house party at a residence a few miles from her apartment. While there was still some tension between them, they kept texting each other throughout the evening, but then at around 10 p.m., she stopped responding to his messages. When he still hadn't received any reply the following morning, he attempted to call her and sent several text messages, but again, he got no response. This is when he went to her building, but had no choice other than to leave when he couldn't find her there. While he was certainly the first suspect, his name was soon cleared thanks to surveillance footage from the night of the attack. Security camera footage showed him visiting a convenience store and a jack-in-the-box restaurant. Several people from the house party were able to confirm that he was there when the attack took place, since they saw him there between 9.45 and 10.15 p.m. His innocence was fully confirmed when it was revealed that much of the DNA found in the apartment belonged to a woman, not a man and police now had a lot of unanswered questions. They then started the task of speaking to all of the women in Juliana's life. There was suspicion that someone who knew her might have become jealous of her looks or her lifestyle, or that there was some sort of love triangle involved. Investigators collected DNA samples from everyone they spoke to, but this led nowhere, as no match was found for the samples that had been removed from her apartment. This is when they discovered that there was another man in the picture a doctor by the name of Munir. Upon further investigation and questioning, investigators learned that Juliana and Munir had met each other while she was employed at a restaurant in 2007. She must have made quite an impression on him since he offered her a job as a medical assistant and she readily agreed. Working as a hostess or a waitress in a restaurant obviously doesn't pay very well, at least not considering all the crap you have to deal with from patrons, and she must have jumped at the opportunity to earn a little more money but their relationship wouldn't remain merely professional for long. Before too much time had passed, she agreed to move in with Munir, and during this time, Munir would bring her gifts and allow her to live in his upscale house that was located in Beverly Hills. While this notion must have been flattering for a while, it didn't take long for Juliana to become concerned about Munir's behavior, as she started feeling as though he was obsessed with her. He told her that he wanted to buy her an expensive car when she turned 21, and at one stage, he even suggested that they get married. There was no doubt that she would be left wanting for nothing since he was a very wealthy man, 
but he was known to waste money on jewelry, cars, and women, which she found overwhelming and somewhat concerning. It's unclear if Munir simply got the wrong message from Juliana, or if he was making things out to be much more than they really were, almost some sort of delusional wishful thinking. But whatever the case, Munir's behavior only got stranger and stranger from here, and it didn't take Juliana long to realize she needed a way out. Juliana eventually got her wits about her and decided she needed to end the relationship with Munir, after which she relocated to the bungalow in Santa Monica, which was being paid for by her father. The pair parted ways on good terms, and they even stayed in touch, which is a little bit surprising. One of Juliana's friends would later reveal that she, Juliana, and Munir traveled to Las Vegas on one occasion to celebrate her friend's birthday. But all was not as it seemed, as her father started looking into Munir's background and what he found was seriously startling. He discovered that Munir not only was married at the time of his supposed relationship with Juliana, but that he had three children who were living in Lebanon. He was certain that his family didn't know about Juliana or any of the other women that he'd been seen with, and so he relayed what he'd found to his daughter. She was taken aback and upset by the news, and immediately told him that she no longer wanted to see him, and she even told him to never speak to her again, which was probably the right move. While Juliana and Munir were no longer on good terms, her father, Greg, who was a pharmacist, still kept in touch with Munir since they'd been working on a business deal together, but it never came to fruition as the deal fell through after Greg became concerned that Munir was running his business somewhat illegally. Evidence was quickly beginning to stack up against this man, and it quickly became clear he simply wasn't the man he portrayed himself to be. Investigators found it strange that Juliana had her life ended just a week after this deal had gone sour, and they soon started suspecting that Munir knew much more than he was letting on. But bear in mind, his DNA was not found at the scene of the crime. They were unable to interview him at the time, since he'd left the country, go figure. But they decided to start digging into his past in the meantime. Since he was known to have had a somewhat sordid history with women, they started looking at the women who'd worked for him in the past. They had a suspicion that the female DNA found at the crime scene may somehow be connected to Munir, but they had no proof to confirm these suspicions. Most of his former female employees were either no longer in touch with him or had no knowledge of Juliana. But when they looked into the history between him and a 47-year-old woman named Kelly Sue Park, they started to grow even more suspicious. He'd made several substantial payments to her, totaling over $1 million in just 18 months. She'd been involved in several of his business deals in the past while she was working as a real estate broker. While they were by no means certain that Park was connected to the attack on Juliana, they decided to have her followed in hopes that they could collect a DNA sample without her knowledge. If she was somehow connected to the crime, she may have alerted Munir to the fact that the authorities wanted to collect her DNA, and so it was decided that this should be done without raising any suspicions. Their patience eventually paid off when they were able to collect one of her discarded cigarette butts, and it was sent away to be analyzed. Before long, investigators were informed that they'd finally made a breakthrough in the case, as it was found that Park's DNA was a perfect match for the samples collected from Juliana's bungalow. There was now no doubt that Park was present when the attack was carried out, and there was a good chance that Munir was involved somehow, though he still hadn't returned to the US and so couldn't be questioned yet. Obviously, Park was apprehended and immediately charged with the crime against Juliana. It's believed that Munir found out about her arrest just a few days later since he suddenly vanished into thin air, though it's believed at the time he was likely somewhere in Lebanon, possibly to avoid being tracked down by the police. The only problem was the motive for Juliana's crime was still unclear. It was suggested that Munir didn't take kindly to their relationship coming to an end or that he'd gotten upset when his business deal with her father fell through. So it was theorized that he'd hired Park to carry out the attack in retaliation. One of the most widely accepted theories was that Munir had instructed Park to intimidate Greg into accepting the deal that they were working on, and that as part of this intimidation, she was to pay an unfriendly visit to Juliana in her apartment. But when Juliana started fighting back, Park was taken by surprise, and she ended up ending her life as the two women struggled for survival, though this was still just a theory. 
This would be a point that was brought up in court later on, as it was argued that Munir agreed to pay Park a six-figure sum to follow through with his plan. When news of Park's arrest made it to the media, the LA Times published details revealing that she was known to have had intimidated people in the past whenever they went against Munir's business plans. So it made sense that she may have been involved this time as well. On one occasion, she intimidated a bank manager who had also canceled a deal. And on another, she was told to intimidate one of his clients who'd failed to keep up with his payments as promised. But despite the wealth of evidence found in Juliana's bungalow and DNA placing her at the scene, Park decided to plead not guilty to second degree homicide charges. Her defense attorneys revealed that they would be willing to tell the court that the two women never met each other and that the only connection between them was Munir, who was still out of the country. The prosecution, on the other hand, intended to reveal that Park had been hired by Munir as an enforcer and that her attempt at intimidation ultimately led to Juliana's life being ended. But this didn't have the intended effect. The judge in this case ruled that this theory could not be used during the trial since there was no solid evidence to back it up, and instead the state would have to rely on evidence found at the scene, including the DNA that was matched to Park. They would also mention the fact that Park stood nearly six feet tall and that she was an intimidating and self-assured woman who could easily fulfill the role of an enforcer or intimidator if Munir ordered her to do so. This woman was genuinely scary to be around, and she apparently just had a personality and energy about her that was just difficult to get past. The evidence against Park had mounted, and it seemed all but certain that she would be found guilty of ending Juliana's life. Her DNA had been found in several places in the apartment, including on Juliana's clothes, inside the locks on the front door, on the telephone, and most incriminating of all, on her throat. On a plate that had been left in the kitchen sink, crime scene investigators found a drop of blood along with the fingerprint that belonged to Park. This, according to the prosecution, was undeniable proof that Park was inside the apartment that night. And since the two women didn't know each other, she would have no reason to be there other than to carry out an attack as ordered by Munir. Furthermore, they believed it was indisputable that she had ended her life since her DNA was found on her throat indicating that Park was the one who ended her life via manual strangulation. But pinning this woman for such a crime was much easier said than done. She wasn't going down without a fight, much like the night that she encountered Juliana in her apartment. Her defense team had more than a few tricks up their sleeve, and they were willing to pull out all the stops to get Park off the hook. Kelly Park's defense team had a different theory that they claimed cast doubt on the suggestion that she was in the apartment with Juliana on the night of the crime. Since there were no witnesses that night, they contended that there was too much uncertainty as to what had transpired. And furthermore, they theorized that Park's DNA could have ended up in the building through DNA transfer. This occurs when someone touches an item belonging to someone else, and that item is then found at a crime scene resulting in an innocent person being suspected of a crime when it's discovered that their DNA is present. Another example of this is when an item is touched by two people, resulting in DNA from one person being transferred to the other. In other words, Park may have touched an item that was also touched by Juliana's killer, and they then unwittingly transferred her DNA to the crime scene. In this case, they made reference to a towel that was possibly used by Park when she was in Munir's Beverly Hills home five months earlier. They suggested that the killer committed the crime and then attempted to remove their fingerprints and DNA with the use of that same towel, transferring Park's DNA to the scene in the process. They mentioned that Park would have visited this house on several occasions since she was known to be a business associate of his, and since Juliana had lived in that same house at some point, Park's DNA might have inadvertently been transferred to Juliana's bungalow. When discussing Munir's role in the crime, the defense argued that a failed business deal with Juliana's father didn't seem like strong enough motive to have her life ended, and neither was the fact that she had ended their relationship. As for the large amount of money that was transferred from Munir into Park's bank account, they argued that these were simply payments that were owed to her since she and Munir were known to have conducted business with each other. The prosecution revealed to the court that Munir had, in the past, boasted that he employed a woman who was the female equivalent of James Bond and they built their case around the suggestion that she was paid to work as an assassin, and that Munir had more than enough motive to order a hit on Juliana. 
The case was just getting wilder and wilder, and some aspects of the court proceedings are just downright unbelievable. The LA Times reported that Park's telephone records showed that she called Juliana's place of work and that she was present outside her bungalow the night before the attack was carried out. Since they had never met, there could only be one reason for Park to try and contact her, to figure out her schedule and to stake out her apartment while planning the attack. It was also alleged that Park and Munir had collaborated on a health insurance fraud scam and that at the time it was still being investigated by authorities. The trial would last until 2013, an incredibly long time, but the verdict the jury reached on behalf of Park, it shocked everyone. After all the court proceedings had been carried out, the jury found Kelly Sue Park not guilty. Juliana's friends and family members who were present at the proceedings were outraged at the verdict and made their feelings known, shouting that she knew she was guilty and that something had gone terribly wrong while she was being let out of the courtroom. This meant that no one would be held accountable for the loss of Juliana's life, and that the one man connected to everyone involved in the case would not even be questioned since he couldn't be reached. This verdict, for all the painfully obvious reasons, must have had a devastating effect on her family who only commented on the outcome via a written statement in which they expressed their sadness and shock at the fact that justice had never been served. Worse yet, Lebanon doesn't have an extradition treaty with the United States, and the country does everything it can to protect its own citizens, meaning that as long as Munir stays put, he'll never face judgment for his actions. They found it unbelievable that the massive amount of evidence against Park and Munir wasn't enough to see them convicted. They've done their best to come to terms with the decision, and her mother, Patricia, now uses her daughter's room when she paints, helping her feel some small level of connection to her daughter, even after all these years have passed. She says that she's resorted to using art as a coping mechanism, since she produces her best work when she's emotional. At times, she feels as though she and Greg, along with their son Patrick, are still stuck in 2008 when the attack took place, since they still find it hard to believe that Park and Munir walked away scot-free. But thankfully, she's found new meaning in her life, since she remembers her daughter through her art, and after overcoming breast cancer, she started looking for the positive aspects of any obstacles she faces. As for Munir, it's believed that he joined his actual family in Lebanon after fleeing from the US, and today he still maintains he's innocent in the matter. He's never been charged or even questioned. He was placed under arrest in Germany in 2015, when it was suspected that he was committing medical fraud, but nothing ever came of this. It's alleged that he allowed a physician's assistant, who had never attended medical school, to perform surgeries when his patients were assured that he would be the one to perform the surgeries. More than 20 of his patients have come forward to report that they've been left with permanent damage as a result. For reasons unknown, he was released and then traveled to Lebanon once again, where he was again suspected of committing medical fraud. Park was also arrested in 2015 in the German case, when it was found that she was involved. She was charged with conspiracy, lying to patients, disfiguring patients and botched surgeries, and cheating insurance companies out of $150 million. She was eventually released on $1.5 million bail, and once again managed to slip out of the grasp of police. Juliana's case is one with no happy ending and no easy answers. Her family did their best to protect her from Munir when it became apparent that he was living a double life, but in the end, he walked away without so much as a slap on the wrist. Some may consider this to be an unsolved case, but I think we all know the truth here. Sometimes the justice system simply fails those who trust that due process will prevail, no matter the amount of solid evidence that's presented. One can only hope that lessons are learned from this case in hopes that similar failures don't become commonplace in the future. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to like and subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.